Welcome back. So now it's creative thinking and problem solving. So this is where you need to change your mind a little bit and, and, and um, think differently. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. So creative thinking is different. And this is where you now go back to grade 10. Different and to be creative. It's outside the box and it's unconventional. So that means completely in a different way to the way you would normally think. Problem solving is you need to understand a process. It's steps that needs to be followed. And why do we follow these steps? Why do we follow these processes? Is to make sure that we address an issue. That is why we do problem solving. So that means there is a challenge and we are addressing the challenge. So <clears throat> this is the concept you need to start off with. So if we now move forward and we look at the difference between decision making and problem solving, then if we look at decision making, so this is where we need to make choices. So this is done by one person. One person makes the choice. So it's the normally a member of management that makes these choices. Then <clears throat> the decision is then between alternatives. So that means you look at what are my alternatives or my options. And that is then what you base your decision on. So you choose between these alternatives or these options. Then you also need to understand that decision making is part of problem solving. So that means in the problem solving cycle, in the steps, you will be making decisions. So therefore, if we look at problem solving, this is done by a group or by a team. So that means they decide, they discuss the information, the challenge, and then they would look at what are the alternatives and the options, and then a choice is made by one person. You look at problem solving where you get um, solutions. So that means you generate solutions. And then this is also a place where you analyze the situation. So that means you look at what is the definite issue and you look at strategies that can address the challenges. So this is where you now need to understand what that means. Now, in order for you to understand problem solving specifically, you look at what is the steps. So your first step would be to identify. Now, the second step is define. Now, sometimes it's difficult to understand the difference. Identifying something is like literally pointing and saying, that is it. If you identify the computer, you point and say, that's the computer. If you define the computer, you would say, that is the computer. I use to do certain things with. So you give an explanation. So when you look at problems specifically, you look at that is the problem. And then when you define it, you say why it is a problem. Then your third step would be you identify solutions. Now, listen to the specific is so more than one solution once you've looked at more than one solution you then select 
um, alternatives. So you look at what can be the option that I have. Once you've now gotten solutions and you've gotten alternatives, you work with an action plan. So you put together an action plan as to how this is going to work. You then implement. Because remember, action plan with the word action means something has to be done. So now you implement the suggested solutions. So you look at what can be done, how am I going to put it into action. You monitor. Now remember, when you monitor, you don't necessarily interact or make adjustments. You monitor. So that means you literally just check the progress. Is it addressing the issue? Then, after you've monitored, you will evaluate. And once you evaluate, this is where you check. Expected results. And you check the actual results. So, what happened? And what was I thinking is going to happen? So, you also, when it comes to exams and tests, especially for the finals, you need to be able to apply. So, that means you need to be able to put this into a explanation where you discuss exactly what will happen. So how are you going to implement it? So acknowledge that there is a problem and then identify the problem. Discuss the nature of the problem. Give possible causes for step two. Step three, you would identify different solutions. You will decide on what was the original causes and so forth and so forth. So the application of this you must be able to put it into more words to make sure that you know exactly what is the scenario. We then look at the different techniques. Now, the techniques is very easy to understand. When it comes to the Delphi technique, you have the word expert. These experts never comes face to face and I'm going to never just so that you can see it is something you need to remember so experts give opinions and they never come face to face so there's no bias so that means the business will then send a questionnaire to different experts. So expert one, number two, and number three. So this is the first step. They set a questionnaire and they send it to the experts. The experts then send back a response. This response They will then send a response and they will then get or you will do a summary of those responses. Should you then decide you are not clear on exactly what it is, you send another questionnaire to the experts. They will then come up with another response which they send back. And you will do another summary. And this process will carry on until you are satisfied and can then make a decision. So you look at how this process can help the business in getting opinions. So when it comes to Delphi, remember, experts, they don't come face to face, so their opinion is unbiased. And that gives you a better idea of what
can be done. So then we move to the force field analysis. Now for those of you who are either Star Trek or Star Wars fans, you will now understand the concept of force field. Now to give you just a little bit of an explanation. Force field means there's something that you are considering so that you look at forces that works for or we talk about pros and then we look at forces that work against. Or we talk about cons. So this is basically what is the advantage, what is the disadvantage. What would be a good thing about this decision, what would be a bad thing about this decision. When you now have to complete or discuss a force field analysis, the thing you need to, the basic concept you understand is it's about advantages versus disadvantages. So when you discuss it, you write the problem in the middle. You will then list everything for or the pros and you will write the cons or the disadvantages or something that is against it. You will then list it. You will then score each one of this out of five. Five being severe, one being not that severe. And this you base on the impact. So that means how is this going to affect? So then you list it, you score it, and you then total it. So five, six, nine, thirteen, fifteen. So in this case, this is less than that, so that means you then either make a recommendation or you make a decision and you can base it on the outcome. So if yes, it's good or no, it's not good or you can actually then decide. Even though the cons are against it, it is something that we can work with. So when you've got everything that's for this particular issue, can make the business better or everything that you've got that's against is then weaknesses you can work on. So that is when you need to apply it. Then you literally discuss it in a paragraph form like I just showed you. Then you've got brainstorming. Now brainstorming is you've got a facilitator which then works with a group of people. Now, you would also see that by means of all these sketches is the reason why I am not an art teacher. So therefore, brainstorming is where you have the facilitator and the group as a whole discuss and gives ideas. So this can be a little bit chaotic. So it's spontaneous, it's contribution where everyone gives ideas and it is a big thing with a discussion and ideas flying around. So it's good for creative thinking. People get creative, that's good. But the bad thing is you get people that can take over. So that means people that are quiet will now not be as involved. The other thing is like making a decision in a WhatsApp group, it is time consuming. So that means you need to be able to have time to actually do this properly. So you would define the idea and the group would then help discuss it. When you look at nominal group technique, 
The best way I can explain it, which you are not going to use to explain in an exam, but for you to understand, and specifically for that purpose only, nominal group technique is organized brainstorming. What I mean by organized brainstorming is you will have a facilitator that then talks about or discusses, mentions the issue. You will then have small groups. And these small groups will then discuss the issues before there is feedback given. So they will discuss, the ideas will fly, and they will then come up with one response which the facilitator will then write on a whiteboard or a flip chart. So they will then make a note of this and they will then choose the best. So the nominal group technique is where they use brainstorming and individuals come up with idea rather than the group as a whole. And that is the difference between brainstorming and nominal group. Nominal group is where you use smaller groups but you still use brainstorming as a technique in this particular one. So ethics and professionalism is the next one we look at. Now, these two are very closely related, but also so much different. So if you want to differentiate between the two, the concept that you need to understand is both of these have to do with right and wrong. The perspective determines which one it is. So it's all about behavior. And that's the one thing you must understand. So ethical behavior, professional behavior. So ethical or ethics would work with what's right or wrong. And this is measured by society. So the concept of what good values do you have and it's in line with society. Whereas professional behavior looks at characteristics. So how people are supposed to behave in a business or with a specific specific profession so that means a specific job so you look at ethical behavior or ethics as the right and wrong according to society you look at morals which is acceptable according to society and you look at focusing on the reputation of the business. So if people will think badly of the business when they hear things, what is their reaction going to be? So professionalism is about the characteristics of the and the behavior in a particular profession or in a job. You look at standards of behavior. So that means what is expected of people? How should they behave in a business? And then you look at the morals or the moral compass. And this is specifically with regards to decisions that needs to be made or decisions that is made in the business. So the difference here is general acceptable morals according to society. Here you look at morals with regards to decision making. So <clears throat> if you look at business practices, so that means unethical business practices are things that you then focus on, which is unfair advertising, which is where they advertise um, second hand goods as new. So they saying something that is not true. So they are lying in their adverts. This 
could then, or the, the, the repercussion of this, or what follows from this, is the fact that unfair advertising can harm consumers. And the way in which you deal with this, so then your strategy would be to have consumers be open enough, the communication channel between the business and the consumers to be open enough, is that this must be reported by the consumers and there has to be an encouragement for fair advertising. That would be then the strategy as to how you handle this. When you look at pricing in, in rural areas, so that means small townships, the products are generally sold by one shop and that one shop then inflates prices. And this is the problem. So that means if it is the only shop in the area, people have no choice. They have to then buy from that particular shop. So that means the business can charge whatever they like. So they inflate the prices because the people have no choice. So that means they then use that as a way to exploit the consumers. So it's all about the exploitation of the consumers. So if they inflate the prices, that means they charge more than they should. Now, this takes income or money from the consumers. And this means they are spending more money than they are supposed to. So they deliberately make the consumers poorer than they actually are. So this once again then how do you get this strategy so that means you can look at reasonable prices so that means the consumers need to ask for reasonable prices they need to um, encourage entrepreneurship so that means people that can open their own business and be competition for that particular um, section or for that particular business. Then you look at tax evasion. Tax evasion means that they don't declare um, income. So you basically say that you are making less money than you should. Um, so that means the idea of the idea behind this is that if you do evade tax there could be fines. So then SARS, if they do find out, there can be fines or they can actually um, send the person to jail. Now, the way in which you deal with this, so the strategy you need to follow or the strategy that must be followed is that SARS encourages to submit returns. So that means you focus on making sure that all the income is declared, that everything is above board and shown, and you look at um, paying tax, the right tax, at the right time, making sure that everything is above board. When you look at unprofessional behavior, it's more about the person in the business. So something where like sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is where one person makes the other person uncomfortable. So when you make someone uncomfortable, and that is with um, sexual advances or sexual nuances, where you, where you ask favors and promise favors in return. So this is then the problem or the or the issue with this is the fact that it makes it unprofessional it provides discomfort for the person that is on the receiving end of the sexual harassment the discomfort makes them less productive because now 
they are worried about the behavior of the other person. So the way in which businesses deal with this, so the strategy with this, is there must be a complaint system in the business. And this complaint system would then have to be followed through with a sexual harassment policy. So the sexual harassment um, policy must then state exactly what is going to happen and then this can turn into a disciplinary action where you look at the code of conduct. So that means the way in which people are supposed to behave. Unauthorized use of work funds focuses on staff So that means people working for the business, employees, are using resources for things that it's not meant for. So that means you can use the internet for the wrong reasons. Um, you use internet for private affairs. It's not just about the funds, but it's also about the resources. Using a company car to pick your husband up from work and go drop your kids off and go buy your groceries because it's got nothing to do with the actual work that you're supposed to be doing. So the unauthorized use of workplace funds and resources. So you look at staff using resources which can now be actual assets or money um, that for something that it is not meant for. So this, the problem and this, or uh, well, the reason why this is a problem is because it increases costs for the business and if it increases the cost for the business that then means there's less profit. So that is why this is an issue. So the strategy that you focus on or the business must focus on is you need to do regular audits. Make sure that you double check the resource use. You then also limit staff that can use these various resources. Make sure that you know exactly which staff member has got what resource and check how they actually use that particular resource. Then you look at the abuse of work time or the abuse of working hours. This is staff doing personal things during work hours. So that is where the staff focus on doing their own thing instead of performing their job. So the problem, why this is a problem, is the reason that the business lose man hours. Now these man hours are paid for. So that means you are paying for something that is not done. You are paying for something that you don't get. So the loss of man hours is then the issue. So therefore you can also look at um, deadlines that is now not met. And that becomes the issue. So you look at how can you prevent this from happening because if the dead the, if you lose the man hours the deadlines are not met that means you can also lose customers and if you lose the customers that becomes a bigger issue so the way in which you then deal with this so the strategy behind dealing with this is um, inform the employees so that means what is expected what is not expected there has to be a code of conduct, so that means they need to know exactly what are they supposed to be doing and how are they supposed to be behaving. The last one on this is then King Code. Now, King Code, you will remember if we go back to legislation at the beginning of the year, you will remember that King Code is about good corporate governance. Now, this good corporate governance is implemented and specifically aimed at um, public companies. So that means 
your companies that are listed on the JSE and it is recommended for all other companies. Now good corporate governance is about professional, ethical and responsible business behavior. The way in which you then look at this responsible behavior is you focus on um, ways in which the business can carry out professional, ethical and responsible business practices. Is So if you look at the practices that must be followed, you look at paying fair wages, you look at um, providing quality goods, goods and services, you look at um, not starting a business for the purpose of or at the expense of another person. Um, you're looking at not making a new business or a competition in such a way that you can kill the competition. Then um, you treat your employees with respect and then the fifth one should they ask you that they can ensure a safe work environment so these are the practices that you need to look at then one thing that you need to go back is if you look at the principles of the king code just a quick revision the principles of king code would then be transparency you would look at liability and you look at responsibility so making sure that decisions are clear and open to all stakeholders that means transparency then you look at liability so there's communication between management and stakeholders there's audits, there is accountable decisions being made. Then you look at responsibility. So the responsibility focuses on the communities, focusing on protecting the environment. And that is the nutshell version of ethics and professionalism. So we're looking at human rights. So human rights, we focus on what are each human allowed? So that means we're looking at the rights of you people and the rights because you are a human. And in South Africa, this is granted to us by the Bill of Rights, which is part of the Constitution. So that is what you need to be looking at the concept that you need to understand so we're looking at the the different rights that a person or an employee has in the business or human rights that you have that can be affected in the workplace so the first one up is privacy so that means it's all about personal information and this means the business may not share any of this personal information. When you look at privacy, you look at HIV status. Now, HIV status may also not be shared unless the employee gives specific um, permission. Then it also looks at emails. So that means email or correspondence might may not be read because it is a violation of a person's uh, privacy then you look at dignity so that means you must be treated with respect so when you look at dignity is how people is treated how employees are being um, placed and used in the workplace 
so they should not be forced to work in situations which is degrading or then embarrassing. So that means work that you're not supposed to be doing for whatever different reasons. Equity is all about equal opportunities. So that is the biggest thing that you must understand. Equity is about the equal opportunities in the business. It means you need to look at equal pay. So same work done must be paid the same way. And then you need to look at the application of law. So all acts must be implemented fairly. Legislation must be implemented fairly. When you look at freedom of speech and expression, then that means there should be open lines of communication. So communication should be between all levels, all channels. And then you need to provide um, employees a platform for grievances. Now, if you look at um, grievances, then you could link the Labor Relations Act to this because that gives us the grievance procedure. So then you look at the right to information. So the workers should have access to information. So it's all about the access to information that is held by the government and the employees should be informed. And this informed means with regards to um, new information when it comes available. So that means the employees must be able to understand where the business is going to, the goals and all of these type of scenarios. Then you look at safety and security. So that means you look at a safe work environment. So the work environment must be free from hazardous products or hazardous areas. You also need to have provided the safety equipment. So if there is um, clothes that needs to be worn, whatever the case may be, gloves, footwear, and then when in the workplace, it also needs to be compliant with the Occupational Health and Safety Act or for the compensation of occupational diseases. Then, this is a question that sometimes people don't necessarily understand. So, human rights versus economic, social and cultural rights. So, the idea behind this is Economic rights of employees focuses on earning potential. So how can the employee as a person earn money? So that means if you look at economic rights, the focus would be on you should be free from forced labor. So that means no person is allowed to be forced to work. There should be fair wages paid. So the economic right and the way in which you could possibly earn means fair wages is paid by um, or according to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. Economic right also when it comes to a safe work environment because if you can't if you work in an unsafe environment that means at some point you will get ill or be injured and then you can't work anymore so that's why the safe work environment is an economic right in the business and then because of the labor relations act you are then allowed to join a trade union and this is an economic right because they will then look after remuneration and they will 
um, negotiate on behalf of the employees. Then you work with cultural rights. So the cultural rights is all about the person. So you look at the person and where their culture comes in. So when you look at cultural rights, the cultural rights is you are allowed to speak your own language. But this is during breaks. So no one can force you to not speak your language. But remember the business language is focused on business. So your own language you're allowed to speak during breaks. Then you business must also then encourage people to participate in cultural activities. So that means if your, your culture has certain days that needs to be observed, businesses, you have the right to then attend to those festivities or activities. Then it also needs to be looking at um, informative on people's different cultures. So that means the business needs to be sensitive to culture and then also use that perspective for um, looking at solutions. So then you can look at how from different perspectives do you see all of these things. So you also then, the, so the cultural right is that people from different um, cultures needs to be employed. So that means the business has um, information with regards to how different cultures would um, react and preferences. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a competitive advantage. And then you have the right and businesses must then make sure that there is tolerance for the different specific cultures. So social rights is about the human. So the, 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 the existence of the particular person. So that means you have the right to social security, so being the person who you are and who you were meant to become. You have freedom to move around. So that means you may not be put into a specific position where you are not allowed to move around. And then you need to look at underage employment. So that means no person is um, forced or allowed to be forced to work under the age of 15 or 16. So that is what the difference is in economic, social and cultural rights. So these are the type of questions that you might get. So when you look at the example questions, then we're going to run through them very quickly. So advise businesses on how to promote cultural rights. So that's the one that we're focusing on. Remember the marks is six. So that means you need to have three bullets because it will be two marks each. Then the idea behind it is remember the language. So the own language, but this is during breaks. That is one of the ways in which the business can um, promote cultural rights in the business. Then you may take part in cultural activities or encourage the employees to take part in cultural activities. And then the business must employ people from different cultures and that would have been the two marks each.
remember, always remember, everything must be in full sentences. That is very important. Then we've got 2.1, which says suggest ways in which the business can promote social rights. So this is where we're looking at the, the human. So we're looking at how the person is a resource. So the social rights employees must have access to social security. So that means you need to make sure that people have that particular access. Then there must be a provision for skills development. So the business must provide with training, skills training or basic development. Then the businesses must be registered or the employees must be registered for UIF. That's one of the, the social rights the, the, the employees have. And you need to um, provide or not need to. The business can provide health care services on the premises. So that means establishing something like a site clinic if it is a mining um, if it is a mine for instance so that gives you the social rights remember if it's eight marks then you must have four so that you can get the two marks each for the full sentence then you look at economic rights so if you look at the economic rights then how do we promote it you must make sure that you are not forcing people to work. So, Blaze, please make sure that you know that you are not forced to work. The business must also, when it comes to economic rights, and it goes about the fair principles, with regards to employment, you look at fair wages must be paid. That's how the business can um, look at promoting all of this. You must be able to look at um, joining a trade union. So now we're on number three, because remember, if it's five, this is only name so that means it'll only be one mark each so then for number four you have the right to take part in a strike and this is also because of the labor relations act and then you need to have um, reasonable work hours or a limitation when it comes to reasonable working hours. So that gives you that. Then we look at inclusivity. Now inclusivity is the concept of no exclusion. So that means people may not be excluded for whatever reason. And this can be based on age or gender or sexual preference, or race, or language, or culture, or whatever disability they may be. So businesses then looks at promoting inclusivity. And this inclusivity can be achieved by means of looking that equality with regards to people being treated equally and you also look at dignity. So inclusivity is also then one thing that you can work with to make sure that there is dignity and respect in the workplace. When you look at diversity, now diversity works on the concept of variety. So there's a lot of different people. Now differences because of 
your age, your gender, your race, your ethnic group, your disabilities. So that means businesses must employ to be able to di be diverse. The business must employ people from different cultures or ethnic groups or cultural backgrounds. So this is where you look at um, differences, the different people. So, inclusivity is about inclusion, whereas diversity is all about difference. Then, you look at the diversity issues. So, diversity issues, poverty, race, gender, language, age, culture, and disability. So, these are the issues that makes people different. And you should then be able to address how the business can look at um, reducing these type of issues. So when it comes to poverty, you need to employ people from all different economic backgrounds. Race, you need to be diverse and inclusive. When it comes to gender, you need to be able to look at equal pay. So people must be paid for the same thing. The jobs must also be promoted amongst men and women. You need to provide training when it comes to language. So that means in the business, whatever business language you are looking at. When you look at diversity issues such as age, then Age is not the predominant factor for promotions, for instance. So that means promotions should happen on um, merit and not on age. When you look at culture, so the business must <clears throat> um, allow for cultural festivals and then the disability, the business must be accessible so that means wheelchair ramps etc then you look at a question that they can ask with regards to diversity issues so when they look at diversity issues so make a list of diversity issues so that gives you six so that is poverty race gender language age and culture and there you have your six um diversity issues. So what is the implication um, of these specific issues? So when you look at implications, you focus on what follows. So what happens or what must the business do in order to address privacy equality, freedom of speech, and security. So explain the implication of the following human rights. So what can or must the business do or not do because of human rights? And this is then what the word implication means. So what needs to happen? One thing that, to end off, you need to understand is the fact that you must be able to explain responsibilities of your employer or your employee with regards to um, safety in the workplace. So what must the employer do to ensure safety? And then also, what must the employee do to ensure safety? Investments. <clears throat> now, investments, you can divide into two sections. And the two sections is then insurance and securities. So when you look at <coughs> insurance, you need to understand what it is and why you take it out. So insurance is cover that is taken out for a possible event 
where there can be damage or loss. So that means you stand to lose something. So insurance is taken out <coughs> because of something that might possibly happen. Now, normally, insurance is divided into insurance, which is short term, and you take it out in case something happens. And the second part, you look at assurance, which is long term, and you take it out against in something that you are assured is going to happen so this you take out for things like theft this you take out um, for something like death that you know definitely will be happening when you look at securities you look at investment opportunities so when you look at investment opportunities, it is a way in which you can then make some money. So you look at managed portfolios, you look at debentures, so that means you are selling the credit the debtors, the creditors of the company to someone else and they then um, collect the money. You look at stock fells, you can look at venture capital. So when someone invests in a new policy, uh, in a new business, sorry, then you look at um, life insurance, and you look at 32 day notice periods or notice accounts. And then also one big thing here is you look at shares, but shares could also be part of managed portfolios. But when we now specifically look at insurance, then we can look at what? is the difference between compulsory and non-compulsory insurance. So that means what insurances does the business have to take out and what insurance do they not have to take out. So compulsory insurance is then things like UIF, which is the unemployment insurance fund. So they, you need to know that's 1% from the employer and 1% from the employee and all of this is paid over to SARS and that is then used in case someone becomes unemployed. Then you also look at the road accident fund. The road accident fund then gets the money which they reimburse people <coughs> for that got hurt in um, road accidents. Um, <coughs> so that means that is funded from levies on fuel and then we've got COIDA which is now associated with the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act but this is the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Fund so that means you look at money that is contributed the business must be registered though and in that case you can then claim so <clears throat> non-compulsory insurance is any insurance which you then take out for insurable interests so uh, insurable risks so non-compulsory insurance is taken out for insurable risks and these insurable risks will be things like theft, burglary, money in transit,
fire disasters and injuries so that means if the business then <coughs> um, if consumers or anyone else gets injured on the premises so that means um, liability public liability insurance so that means it is taken out for insurable risks and that is then the different insurances that you've got when you look at insurance and you want to understand the different concepts then you need to look at over insurance so over insurance that means you are insured for more than the actual value of the asset so in case you in case the value of the asset is 50,000 Rand you are then insured for 60,000 Rand so that means you are over insured under insurance means the value insured for is less than the actual value so that means you look at insuring a 50,000 Rand asset you insure for 40,000 Rand so that the premium can be less so that's under insurance now because of under insurance insurance companies uses the average clause now the average clause then says that if there is under insurance if it is under insured they pay out in proportion so that means in proportion literally means the amount that is insured divided by the market value multiplied by the damages so if we use this example over there so that means the amount insured for was 40,000 Rand the actual value was 50,000 Rand and you then had damages of 15 so that would be your damage if you had damage then you would then get only a proportion so so you look at 12,000 Rand which is then your proportional payout which is less than your damage so that is the idea or the concept of the average clause if you look at investment and you look at the different securities and you look at the different investment options then you need to understand the factors you need to consider when you look at different investment opportunities so when you look at investment opportunities you need to know what the rate of in rate of your investment would be so that means you need to know what your return on investment would be so how much Are you getting back so what is the amount of money that you are going to get back then you need to look at risk so that means how likely is it that you will lose your investment and they def they classify the risk generally in um, small medium or high risk investments and one thing you need to know is that when the higher the risk the higher the return so that means you stand a chance to make a lot of money but you also stand a chance to lose all of it so liquidity is how quickly can your investment be changed into money so how quickly can you sell your investment to make sure that you get the money out when you look at taxation now please don't confuse this 
where you look at taxation when it comes to ethical business practices. Taxation means what is my tax implications on this investment. So that means you need to look at will my investment be valuable still after tax so that if you add deduct your tax off of this are you still making money on this investment is your rate on in return on investment bigger than you would have gotten anywhere else inflation rate how inflation will influence the value of your investment so that means you look at what is the inflation rate versus the interest rate or the rate of return the rate on in return on investment that i get back on this investment that i'm making so high inflation rate decreases the power of money so that means you the grow the the, the growth in your investment will not be um, much or more it has to be then more than inflation so if you look at the investment period so how long will you be investing it? So that means will it be a short term investment, medium term investment or a long term investment? How long would you be able to get away with not having the money or how long do you want to keep the money away for? So when we look, I spoke about shares. So that means you get four different types of shares and then you need to look at preference shares so the different types of preference shares um, because they can be asking you what the different preference shares are and which one and what the definitions are so ordinary shares they receive dividends and that is what the return on investment is when you invest in shares they receive dividends when there is profit so when the business doesn't make profit, ordinary shareholders do not get dividends paid out. So then preference shares. Most of these preference shares receives dividends regardless of profit made. So that means whether there's profit made or not, they will get um, dividends and that dividends is calculated on a fixed rate that you need to understand bonus shares are shares that is gifted to shareholders so it is in place of dividends sometimes they get bonus shares instead of dividend payouts and then founder shares is for shareholders that started the business. So the that started the business, so that means the incorporators of the business will then be issued with founder shares. Then when we look at investment opportunities and the last one we focus on interest. So when we look at interest you need to be able to know what the difference is between simple interest and compound interest. Now simple interest is literally that. It gets calculated over the period and it's one calculation. Compound share is then in essence interest on interest. So when you look at the formula, please, you need to know the formula. So interest is the principal amount times the rate times the time. So the principal amount, so you would then write the formula. You would say the interest is, and if we look at the scenario, the principal amount, which is 30,000, times the rate, which is 12%, times the time which is then fixed deposit for two years you would then get to the amount of 
7,200 Rand. That is my interest payment. When you look at compound interest, compound interest, you need to know the formula and you need to know that there's a kink in the end. So the total investment is then equals to my principal amount, which is 30,000 Rand, multiplied by 1 plus my interest and then to the power of n and that to the power of n is then the length of your investment so the to the power of 2 so then you would get to the amount of 37,632 and this is what I meant by with the kink in the end that is your total investment it does not say interest so therefore your interest would be the 37,000 minus the original principal amount and you would then get 7,632 and that would then be your interest calculation. So management and leadership. So you need to be able to know what the difference is. You need to know what the different styles are and you need to know how conflict functions or function how conflict happens in the business management and leadership will also be synonymous with team so that means you need to know what a team is how a team is formed and that type of information so looking at management versus leadership so leadership is all about an individual or a group and this group then influences followers this followers is then also inspired by the leadership so leadership is something that cannot be taught it is something that naturally happens Leadership is also the situation where there is vision and that vision is then shared with the followers. And that is one of the reasons why a leader is then someone that people follow. So that means it influences human behavior. That is the one thing that you need to understand it inspires the focus of a leader is on what as well as why so that means you look at efficient ways to get things done so there's motivation and the focus is more on the people so that means it's people orientated when you look at management is a function in the business so that means that function in the business means management is a position it's a job that someone gets appointed into now this has certain tasks and that tasks is planning leading organizing and controlling and that goes back to grade 10 so a manager is in that position because he was appointed and that position comes with authority so that is the premise from which you look at so when you look at leadership is A guide and this is where it now screwed up so leadership influences and then you look at management that guides human behavior so the human behavior is then guided there is control systems that is in place which makes procedures 
necessary for things to happen. This focuses on, so management focuses on how and when. You look at enforcing the rules. So that means you have to follow the rules. It is an instructional approach. So that means telling someone instead of motivating. And then they are, like this one was people oriented. This one is task oriented. So that means it focuses on what must be done. Then because we look at teams and we look at manager is then part of a team. So the team part I'm going to just jot through very quickly. So what makes a team successful? The fact that there is shared values or there is mutual trust. That makes a team successful. You look at interpersonal attitudes and behavior. So that means you look at people working together. There's a good relationship. Members are committed. You look at good communication. When you look at a group, you look at communication. So that means there's clear procedures in the group which makes sure that the group functions well. And then you've got cooperation which means the people are working together they're working towards and this is the important part the same goal their shared goals that is worked towards so that means when you look at criteria these are the few ones then you've got a uh, characteristics which means that you now look at team values you look at how people are shared how ideas are shared and how the group then actually function. When you look at the stages of team development, also something that we did in grade 10, which they can actually ask you questions on. So first, there's forming. So that means the group, different people come together and the group is formed. Then you've got storming. So this is where the group fights in inside these fights they are fighting because they don't know who the leadership is they don't know who to actually follow but then once the hierarchy in the different in the team is sorted out and there's different ideas that is now being channeled and the power struggle is over then you get to the point where things become normal so norming happens so there is agreement, there's consensus, people are now start working together. So that means the working style has been developed. Once you norm, that means you can get to the performing stage. So that means this is where strategies are implemented. Action is taking place. So there's no interference, there's clear direction and there's processes and structures in place. And once you then have done and performing happened, you get to adjourning or also known as morning. And this morning is then when goals have been met. So that means when you've reached the goal, you get to a point where this is then where it happens. So the group then disbands and it can be traumatic. And that's why they talk about morning. So when we look at the different leadership styles, so now we look at how does leaders go through and look at what the scenario is. How do leaders lead? Now, I'm not going to bore you with too much details. I'm going to show you basic differences between the different leadership styles, which makes it easy to identify because that is one thing that in the test 
you are going to have to do. You must be able to identify the leadership style. So with democratic, the first thing you need to know about democratic is the leader lets the group participate. So they are part of the decisions being made. So that means they have a say. Once they have a say, that is a positive thing. Because the positive thing is they now feel valued because they can communicate. And that has an impact on the business. Which means the clear communication that happens focuses on the improvement of the institution or the business. So you need to know that this is where there's group participation. The leader takes the people's opinions into consideration when he makes decisions. The other thing with regards to this is, and still on impact, you look at inexperienced staff can make wrong decisions. So that means this is the negative part, where you look at the positive part. So the wrong decisions can be made because of inexperience. Because you have a group, it's time consuming. So that means making a decision by means of group is time consuming. And that is a negative part. So the biggest idea with regards to democratic is the leadership takes the consideration takes into consideration the group's opinions. When it comes to autocratic, this is the leader decide. Point blank, no nothing, doesn't listen to anyone and does not take any other opinions into consideration. The good thing about this is work gets done. It gets done on the schedule as decided and the line of communication is clear. It's from the top to the bottom and that's where it ends. So there's direct supervision and it provides a strong leadership and this is good for um, crisis situations. So the fact that the leader makes all the decisions, there is division. So the division means that the leader is kind of separate because he gives instructions and don't listen to opinions. So this can demotivate workers. So that means they don't necessarily want to take part as much. So this could negatively impact on the productivity of the business. So it also reduces um, creative ideas, which can be a negative thing for the business. So autocratic, leader makes the decision, no opinion is taken into account. When you look at bureaucratic, now bureaucratic is where they are focused on the process. So bureaucratic looks at the process that needs to be followed, that all the necessary boxes are ticked. And that is the important part of uh, bureaucratic leaders. They follow the process to the T. So that means rules are followed and the process are followed precisely. It works well when there needs to be specific control. Then it needs to be implemented. So a good thing because of the bureaucratic is that this is good for health and safety in a business because it is a very bureaucratic process. The negative thing about this, on the other hand, however, is it is ever so complicated. So that means you need to have all of the rules and all of these things 
um, in place. And it is ever so tiring and time consuming when you want to do this. There's very little room for error. So that means you cannot deviate at all. So it's not very adaptable. And there's a very big lack in creativity. So that means it's not something that focuses on getting new ideas. Laissez-faire is generally when the leader works with experienced people. So this is where the leader lets them do it. There's no involvement. He doesn't check up. The workers are allowed to make their own decisions. So em workers make their own decisions. So that is the good thing about the laissez-faire. So that means it focuses on the workers doing what they need to do because they have the necessary experience. So that means they have freedom to perform the tasks whichever way they like. So that means there's motivation because there is trust. The only the, the other thing or the other hand of this coin or the other side of the coin is the fact that there can be a lack of clear leadership. So that means the fact that the people can do whatever they want and follow the process whichever they want can be demotivating. So that means the fact that they are not shown what needs to be done, it is a potential problem. So there can be underperformance, which then does not help with productivity in the business, and this can lead to conflict. So that is the idea. Leaders let them do it and they don't interfere. Then you've got charismatic. So charismatic is the people that you know. So the charismatic leaders are the one that is charming. And this is the person that you would like to be close to. Now, it is nice because you have an expert selling a vision. That is the big thing when it comes to charismatic. There's a vision. There's a clear goal. So this means you can achieve results, which is good because now you have motivated employees because they know, because of the clear vision, there is results. So the people are ever so inspired. When you look at charismatic the leader believes he's bigger than the team. So that means he believes without him, the team cannot necessarily function. And then sometimes there is a collapse in the team when the leader does leave. And the leaders are then also intolerant. And intolerant by means of change. They do not like change and they do not like to be challenged. So charismatic is all about those charming people that you know. Transactional is straightforward. If you do, you get. So that means there's bonuses or free time or whatever they give in order to get people to do. If you don't, there is punishment. So that means there is consequences. Which is then good because people now know exactly what they need to do. So it is encouraging to people that they know if they do certain things they will receive rewards. It improves productivity because people are now 
motivated to work harder and that means goals are reached which is a good thing when you now lose the idea of punish or you use the idea of punishment then that means people lose creativity because now they focus on the work that must be done they don't necessarily think of how can we do this better so there's constant monitoring so they check up constantly on this it is a very controlling environment so that means the people working in it has got no room to move or breathe so that can be demotivating for people and people are not necessarily understanding of how all of this happens so be sure as to look at the morale of people so then you've got different theories now so the theories is looking at how can we now look at what happens so when you look at the theory it means there's been a research done and leaders and follows theory means that the teams achieve results so there is results when there is an understanding so that means understanding between the leader and the followers so they know where they're going they know what the situation is so the followers will listen and the followers while listening they will then be willing so there is a willingness because the followers listen that means they will then accept responsibility so when they accept responsibility they focus on doing the work so if there is something that didn't work they will take the responsibility the leaders will also lead by example so that means they will show what they actually want to see so if they want people to be early at work work while they are at work they will then do that and lead by example situational leadership means there will be a different style and this will be determined by the situation so according to the situation they will decide what leadership style they will use and this is then dictate a dictated and it will be adaptable so that means they will change their style depending on how the situation is what they are focusing on so there is also then mutual trust so the followers trust the leader to know what leadership style to actually use in which situations when you look at transformational that means this will be because of a dynamic environment so that means there's changes happening and transformational mean it will move from one place the leadership will take the people to a new place so changes that happens in the business so there is expectations there's motivation the leaders inspire the followers they have trust so there's inspiration because of the change that needs to happen there's trust in this particular situation and there's also intellectual stimulation so that means uh, stimulation would be because of the change people would then look at how can this 
be better. Just to end off, we look at conflict and we look at grievance. Now, conflict is something that you look at. This is where there's a disagreement between two or more parties. So because of people that don't get along, so you need to be able to differentiate between what is conflict and what is a grievance. So there's a clash of opinion, there's a disagreement between two people where grievance is the more serious or more official where there's unhappiness or the employee is unhappy and they then lay a formal complaint. So there's a work-related issue and this will be something like payment or safety or discrimination or unfair treatment. That would then be a grievance whereas conflict is purely a disagreement between two or more parties. So for the exam, you need to be able to know how to handle conflict. So there is certain steps, which is very clear in the one pages. You also need to do what is the procedure for a grievance. So that means, and please, you need to know what the difference between these two are. You need to understand what the difference is. So conflict versus grievance. And that is it for now.